To bunch of apes. I'm your host Sam Harris, and uh, as if you haven't heard the podcast before, I'm on a bit of a, a personal journey, really, to explore one of my areas of interest. I kind of only came upon this interest quite late in life when I already had a job. So I've set this podcast up to explore my interest in human prehistory. It gives me the great opportunity to speak to wonderful guests, such as Bernie Taylor. Uh, hello, Bernie. Hello. Bernie, can you hear me? If you're looking for Bernie, that, that's not me. My name is Trevor. Oh, God, sorry, Trevor. <laughs> oh, <laughs> brilliant. Okay, my last guest was called Bernie. I'm so sorry. No wonder you weren't answering. Do you know what? I do edit these, and I think that one might make the edit room floor, okay? You want to go <laughs> for the edit? Okay. <laughs> It, but, it uh, might not be the first and so <laughs> well how embarrassing uh okay so i am so i'm on this journey and it's giving me the opportunity to meet and have some wonderful guests on the podcast such as trevor hello trevor trevor jackson hello um and nice trevor, to be here trevor you are a lecturer at the university of oman is that right I'm currently lecturing at the University of Technology and Applied Sciences in Salala, Oman, which okay. is about as out there as you can get in the in the educational world. I'm about a stone's throw from Yemen, and my students are largely uh, first generation. Uh, well, the first generation of their tribe to uh, seek higher education. I teach mostly Bedouin and Jabali students in a rural mountainous area of southern Oman. Wow. Okay. Uh, see, now I wanted to talk to you about your work and the development of Shane in human evolution, but I'm going to have to ask some questions about Yemen first, I think. Sure. Um, so... Okay, so you you say you were teaching the first sort of people from those tribes to receive formal education. So are you, are you teaching in English? Oh, sure. So they speak English as their first? I teach. No, their first language is, is Arabic. Okay. And they, they all speak a little English, but it's something that uh, is, is definitely encouraged. What's going on in Oman these days is that... Um, it, it's becoming clear that the end of the oil pipeline is coming and that they're not going to be able to depend on their oil wealth forever. Um, Oman is not as wealthy a country as Saudi Arabia by any means, but they do have some oil. They actually have a substantial amount of oil. Uh, as you probably know, the oil price has been quite low lately. And for that reason, uh, the, the, the country is starting to suffer. They need to find some other means of, of uh, ob obtaining uh, revenue in the country. And uh, that involves English, that involves globalization, that involves uh, doing all the things that other countries need to do. And uh, o Oman is uh, it's a wonderful country. Um, it is uh, usually when people ask me, uh, first thing they ask me is, is it safe? Mm -hmm. And well, I'd say it's about five times safer than New York, maybe 10 times <laughs> safer than New York. It is, it, it's a very safe country. The, the Omani people are friendly and warm hearted. Uh, they are neither Sunni nor Shiite, as you may know. Uh, the Sunni Muslims and the Shiite Muslims have been e at each other's throats for years and years. And Omanis are actually of a sect called uh, the Ibadi sect of uh, Islam. And they don't have anything to do with Sunni or Shiite. They couldn't care less about what they're doing there. 
And so it's, it's uh, at, as a Muslim country, it's just about as friendly as a Muslim country as you're ever going to get. I've been here five years and I've had a wonderful time. Hmm. Good stuff. Well, I have to say, when you say somewhere is five times safer than New York, um, I'm from Devon in the UK, which is a tiny little <laughs> rural area. So New, New York is still uh -huh. terrifying. So f maybe 10 times safer than New York make me feel reassured well and and the, the the funny thing is i live in a town called salala salala is in the southern end of the country just a stone's throw from yemen in in just just a few miles from me there's a horrendous civil war however we don't get any of it here it, there, there has been no backlash here oh okay and uh it, it, it's kind of the eye of the storm. We often hear about violent things happening in countries very close to us. Uh, however, n nobody seems very interested in attacking Oman, and Oman is not interested in attacking anybody else. So it's actually a wonderful place to live. So well, long may it stay that way, hopefully. Um, okay. I hope so. So... Uh, one of the things I was really keen to talk to you about today was, was again, your work on, I guess, the the evolution of shame as a human sort of social emotion, I guess I would, I would call it. Um, and yeah, I understand yeah. your, my research area. And I understand you're writing a book called Shame and Shaming in the 21st Century. But you said that the first sort of opening chapters of the book are, are on the evolution of shame. Um, so that was, yeah, yes. that was the area I wanted to talk to you about. Um, so how do we, when do you think that, because obviously the word shame is, is a word, so therefore it has to be expressed linguistically through some sort of verbal communication. But when do you think the sort of concept, the emotional concept of shame, when do you think there's evidence for that in human evolution? Well, that is an excellent question. And uh, first of all, let, let me back into it um, a little bit. And uh, first of all, uh, tell you about why I'm trying to answer that question in the first place. Mm. Um, my initial interest started when I began to notice something just started bugging me. I, I, I compared the way life in general felt 10 or 15 years ago and the way it feels now, and there was just something different. And I finally came to the conclusion that, you know what? People treat each other differently today than they have just a short time ago. And I thought, in what way? Are, 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 what, and I think, well, I don't think we're as nice as e to each other as, as we have been in the past. Incivility seems to be a big part of life today. And as I thought more about it, I began to realize that, well, it's shame. People shame each other more than they do in the past. Or as that boils down to the average person's daily life, uh, shame or the threat of shame is around us more than it has been in the past. Fear of shame is around us. The idea that if we say something, we will be shamed, or if we do something, we will be shamed. And it's not necessarily something that you can point to somebody as saying us. It seems to be embedded in the, our work processes and in the organizational structures that we live in and the codes of conduct that our human resources department's hands out and the orientation meetings that we have to attend when we begin college and on and on and on and on. It, be, it's, it, it has become in a way in, ingrained in a great deal of how our, uh, 
how our society is structured. Now, a lot of this, uh, you can say, well, it, it, it sounds, you, you know, it's the internet. And my answer to that would be, well, yeah, the, in, the internet is so much a part of our lives and it seems to be causing so much. And yes, there is a connection between shame and the internet, but it's not something that you can just snap your fingers and say, aha, I got it, it's Facebook. It's Facebook that's doing it to us. You kind of have to back up a little bit to see what's actually going on. And that's where evolutionary psychology comes in. I began to realize that in order to understand what was going on in contemporary culture today, we would have to go all the way back to figure out why people treat each other in particular ways to begin with. And yes, that involves maybe going back a couple million years. Um, it involves going back and comparing ourselves to animals. And one question that people sometimes ask me is, do animals feel shame? And for instance, one person told me, I'm positive my dog feels shame. When my dog does something and I yell at it and I point my finger at it, his head goes down, his eyes go down, his, his entire feature slumps. And yeah, that's something to consider. But you know what? When your voice changes and you jingle your keys and you say, okay, let's go for a walk. What does the dog do? Woof, woof, woof. All right. It's all forgotten. It's distant history. It's never going to be thought of again. Was the dog thinking, gee, I am a disgrace to all dogdom. I am the worst example of any dog on earth. I shouldn't, I shouldn't even be alive. I'm such a bad dog. And the short answer is no, the dog isn't doing that. And once you jiggle your keys and go out for a walk, it's never going to remember anything about what your tone was in the first place. So do animals feel shame? Well, they feel let's call it proto shame. They feel something that that is rooted in the same neural processes that human shame is. But in terms of the social complexity, in terms of how long it can last, in terms of the emotional damage that it is capable of inflicting on someone? No, absolutely not. Your dog doesn't feel that in the way a human is capable of feeling it. So then the next question becomes, well, what is it about humans that makes us feel shame? And how is it different from chimpanzees or other primate species or other mammals? And the answer most academics agree is shame is something that enables us to complete complex social goals together. And what I mean by a complex social goal is a goal that will help everybody in a community live a better life that you need cooperation in order to achieve complex social goals. Can animals work on complex social goals? Well, they don't have language and they don't really have the foresight and they don't really have the tools, but mostly the reason that they are not able to work on complex social goals the way humans are is because they don't have theory of mind. And what I mean by theory of mind is the ability to intuit what others are thinking alongside of the ability to know that they're doing the same thing. They're trying to figure out what we're thinking and we're trying to figure out what they're thinking and we both know that the other guy is doing it. That is the sort of environment that makes shame possible. 
that yes. makes it possible that if I'm doing something terribly wrong, I know that the 15 people that live around me can all feel very negatively about me. And that could have really huge negative uh, negative consequences for me. So okay. that's the start. That's where we start a conversation about shame in prehistory. Hmm. So I guess so just to check I've understood that then that the idea is that um, shame is is something that is caused by that ability to have theory of mind and to have a concern about or a negative feeling about other people thinking negatively about you. And that would Absolutely. Be... Okay. So uh, is there then, I guess, a sort of a bit of an argument that, that shame is, um, is something that can have obviously a very positive effect on the culture the, the culture that the group is in but actually if you if you are over shame if you're over feeling that shame then that'll have a negative impact on the individual well first of all let's talk about what shame enables us to do mm -hmm. shame enables us to as i said to achieve complex social goals let's let's uh Let's generate a list of, of what the main complex social goals are that most academics agree uh, were instrumental in the formation of human emotions. Um, cooking together in a community, bringing meat home from a hunt to share with the community that then cooks that meat on an open fire and eats it together as a community. No other primate, no other mammal can do anything like that. And if you think about everything involved with just that, picture this, four hunters kill a large hoofed animal on the savanna. They have been chasing it for hours and hours. It is now five o'clock in the evening. They've been up since 6 a.m. that morning, and they're seven miles away from home base where they left the women and the children and the older people and everybody that didn't go on the hunt. Now, there's nothing preventing them from starting a fire, assuming they have fire, and eating the kill right there. They're tired, it's late, they're hungry, but you know what they do? They take out their stone tools and they cut it up into portions and lug the whole carcass back to camp to share. Now think about that for a minute. That is an incredible thing to do for an animal. Why did they do it? And if you want to answer that question, the only possible reason that they would do something for that is because they cared more about what the people back home thought than they did for their own pleasure. They were uh, delaying their own gratification to eat it right there on the savanna like any other animal would, and they lugged the whole carcass back home to share. And the only possible explanation for that would be that they care about what others thought. Now, here is where the, the, the discussion can diverge. There, there's actually two emotions involved here. Pride. Hey, folks, here we are. Yeah, it's a long day. You hungry? Stoke the fire up because we've got some food. Now, that's going to be pride. You're going to feel awfully proud when you get home with that big carcass hungry children all around, everybody wants some of it, and you're the guy that brought the hunt home. So if you think about it, the social status that you can derive from doing this wonderful thing by bringing this wonderful food home for everybody, how happy it's going to make everybody, that's going to give a hunter or a group of hunters incredible social status. Now, you have to think about the 
other side of it, when we compare that to shame, something that you have done wrong as opposed to something that you do right, we realize that these emotions that humans are beginning to generate are something that is creating a sort of hierarchy that is not visible anywhere else in the animal world. Everywhere else in the animal world, especially in primates, let's take, for example, um, chimpanzees are very hierarchical. And the way it works is the big chimp, he's the most violent, and he tells everybody else what to do. He's got a little band of cronies. There are three or four other big chimpanzees, and they're pretty much the top dogs and whatever the three or four chimpanzees tell others to do, they basically have to do. Then you have a hierarchy lower and lower and lower and lower down. If you study chimpanzees, it's not difficult at all to tell exactly where a chimp is on the hierarchy. Hmm. Then below the lowest male begins the hierarchy of the highest female. So the highest female is, in terms of social status, lower than the lowest male. And because of dimorphism, because males are so much bigger, they can enforce it. And then the hierarchy goes down from the top female to the lowest female. Um, and that is the way it's done. Now, humans also have easily distinguishable hierarchies. And sometimes, they can be hierarchies of dominance, of bullying, of, of mere uh, violent uh, ability. But you know what? We have something else. We have what's known as a prestige hierarchy. A prestige hierarchy is such that instead of judging someone's social status by their uh, size, and their ability to harm us, as other primates do, we are able to judge somebody's social status according to their skill and their personality. Are they kind to other people in the community? And what sort of resources they bring to the community? It is what is known as a prestige hierarchy. Hunting, which we're identifying as one of the main complex social goals, is easy to identify something that would have a very significant effect on someone's social status within a prestige hierarchy. And we can also think about this in the opposite. What about the lazy guy that didn't want to go out on the hunt? He decided that he's going to stay home and camp and try to carouse the women. Well, you know what? The women are probably going to get kind of tired of the guy mooching their tubers and whatever they gather from the fields for this guy that's always pestering them versus these other fellas who, after a long time chasing a giraffe, come back with this huge carcass in the evening for everybody to eat. Now, it's not too hard to figure out what the females in that group are going to do in terms of determining the hierarchy of the males in the group. Are they going to favor the lazy ones that hang around camp all day, or are they going to favor the guys that bring them delicious food at night? So that is one area that 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 is one area that we can say uh, would be extremely operative in a pride shame continuum. There are others, and um, we we mentioned cooking and hunting. Um, it also uh, would matter, I think, is to how an individual. Uh, responded and reacted to females who needed care with bringing up children. And I think 
and my thinking is is that this is the most important area when we think of the evolution of human emotions my opinion is that how we responded as a member of a community to the needs of mothers and their children is ultimately what determines uh, an individual's social status in a group. And it is around that idea of childcare that I believe uh, human emotions developed to what we have today. Um, shame and shaming uh, is something that grew up alongside of pride and everything that pride does for a community. And together, both pride and shame propagate us, propelled us forward uh, to become a community that one of the side effects of all of this uh, feelings for each other um, helped us to raise children and to raise them in a healthy manner uh, in which our brains could grow to be much larger than the size of any other primates. And it enabled us to continue to evolve our uh, social abilities to what we have today. I, would, I mean, I would totally relate to that, um, that idea that child rearing had a huge amount to do with tying the community together to getting people thinking more about the group rather than the, themselves because from from my understanding one of the things that differentiates us as a species is um the something called neoteny where we're born with very underdeveloped brain connections so we've got more of a blank canvas is my my understanding of it so you've got um human babies that are born with very little already in place so they're, they're more moldable in their learning um but they can't care for themselves at all. You know, they're extremely vulnerable, whereas a chimpanzee is born and can already cling on to its mum. So it's got kind of a basic understanding of keeping safe. Uh, so I guess, I guess my, my thought would be that something happened in evolution that led to those babies requiring more care, but that would then lead the society or the community on to being more caring of, of, of that child, otherwise it doesn't survive. You brought up uh, an important point. Chimpanzee babies for uh, the first several months of their lives hang on to their mothers, cling to them for dear life, and mm. their mother will not let go of them. <laughs> she won't let anybody in the community touch their baby when she's out of their control. Might let them touch their head, but, but not when, when she's out of their control. Why is that? Well, one of the main reasons is infanticide. It's because other male monkeys, if they can get a hold of that baby, will kill it immediately. Why? Well, most primatologists believe that the reason that they do that is because they want that mother to become fertile again. She's not going to be fertile while she's lactating. So if we kill the baby, she'll stop lactating and then she will become um, uh, fertile again and they can uh, have more mating opportunities. And that's why uh, male primates kill uh, babies if they don't think they're the father. If they think they're the father, they generally won't kill the child. But here's the comparison. Human mothers not only do let other people touch their babies, they have to. Mm. They don't have a choice. A human mother can not rear her baby alone. She must have help from the community. Why? Because of the enormous amount of resources that a human child needs. A human child needs decades to be raised. 
we're not talking about a chimpanzee, which at a certain age, after a certain amount of months, the kid is pretty much on their own. They can get their own food. They can do their own foraging. They're pretty much independent within a fairly short period of time compared to humans. Humans can't do that. Now, let's go back to our original question about shame. What does this have to do with shame? Well, all right, we've got this infant. The mother cannot possibly raise this child by herself. She doesn't necessarily need a father, that's for sure, because we know that uh, fathers uh, are not obligated to uh, raise human children. And the world is full of examples of, of human children who have done just fine without a father. But even though they don't need a father, they do need someone, whether it be a community of sisters and aunts and cousins, or whether it be uncles, including the father, or whatever the configuration is, human children require communities of people that act together and cooperate on providing the resources that they need. And for that reason alone, we know that cooperation and the emotions leading to it, like shame and pride that I've been speaking about, uh, are necessary. You need to have an emotional community that will support doing the work that's needed in order to raise human children. There's simply no other way around it. Mm. So you mentioned neoteny. Um, there is a cultural primatologist, or I think she calls herself a cultural anthropologist. Her name is Sarah Blaffer Hurdy. And her, uh, her hypothesis about infants are that actually they're not a blank slate. They come out of the womb having social skills that no other chimpanzee has. Now, mm -hmm. if you've ever known an, an infant, you can look at an infant two weeks old, and you know what? They're capable of smiling at you. They'll grab your attention, they'll grab your eye, and they'll wink at you. And if you have ever had that experience, uh, a human infant is capable of captivating an adult in a very particular way. And many cultural anthropologists and primatologists believe that the reason that skill evolved is that that infant was actually recruiting adults. The infant was actually saying, hey, take care of me. Can you see how cute I am? Well, when I grow up, I'm gonna be your best pal and you're gonna be so glad that you took care of me because I'm going to be a good member of the community. And when an adult sees an infant smile at them like that, they select them. They say, okay, this is the kid I'm going for. This is the kid that I'm going to provide resources to. They don't have to. And quite frankly, infanticide happen in humanity, sometimes by mothers themselves. Hey, if a human mother, and this is, this is includes today, in 2020, in 2020, if a human mother has a child and does not feel like she's going to get the community to support her with, with raising this child, there's a very good chance that, that that child will be neglected, possibly to the point of death. But what's, and, really, what's interesting, though, about what you're saying there is, is how... Yes, infanticide does still happen in our species, but socially, it's such a no-no. It's such a big, you know, it's it's a it's a thing you, you just you couldn't do. You'd be isolated from society as a human that killed their infants. You'd but be it, shamed. Yeah, you'd be shamed. Yes, yeah. Whereas in chimpanzees, you would you could still be a successful male adult that kills someone else's child because he wants to profligate his his. Uh, genetic material more. Now, can you imagine if, let's just say that, that you, you were 
you were accused of murdering an infant mm. and and you you were put in prison for the rest of the of your life for murdering an infant can you imagine the shame mm. that you would feel about such a horrible thing now that begs the question how far back does that emotion go and i would argue maybe into the millions of years humans remember we're comparing ourselves to chimpanzees male chimpanzees kill infants all the time and then they're and then they're seen the next day mating with the same mother whose infant they killed the day before and she doesn't seem any worse for wear about it she doesn't it doesn't seem to bother her very much right, that's a horrible now, compare that to a human yeah. It's a horrible thing, of course. Humans, now, not to say that humans don't do it, because unfortunately they sometimes do, but if they do, they know that they are. They better not get caught, because what they have done is going to be considered absolutely horrific, and their social life is basically going to be over for good. Now, when did that start? When did humans start feeling shame for infanticide? And I would speculate that this happened in the millions of years ago mm -hmm. if we look again the fact that human mothers need helpers they have to let go of their babies they have to let other people nurture their children because they can't raise them without them that presupposes that the other helpers Sarah Blaffer Hurdy calls them allo mothers. An allo mother is an extra helper for your child. Those helpers must be trustworthy. What is going to keep them trustworthy? And again, we get back to this same shame pride continuum that I've been talking about. It is our ability not only to care what other people think about us, but also the knowledge that they're doing the same thing and that everybody is working on the same project of keeping adequate social status up, which in, when we look at the entire community together in concert, that keeps everybody's behavior up and that keeps the babies happy and healthy and well-fed. Are there not, um, though, examples of primates that will share childcare responsibilities? Because I'm sure I've heard of, of, you know, members of the same family looking after a, an infant of the same species. So is that not still a... Could you not argue that primates at least will do actions that are for the benefit of the group rather than just the self? Um including perhaps childcare? It depends on the primate. Um, in terms of monkeys, monkeys, or rather in terms of chimpanzees, chimpanzees are rather despotic. And in terms of males assisting with childcare, no, almost never. There, there's very little interaction between chimpanzee males and, and uh, offspring. Chimpanzee females are slightly more egalitarian and you can expect a bit more solidarity in chimpanzee female communities, but they're still capable of killing uh, the, their, their peers' uh, children. There's actually a very famous case that uh, Jane Goodall uh, wrote about. Um, a, a mother and a daughter named Passion and Palm and they uh, were seen by Jane Goodall uh, for reasons that she still doesn't understand. Uh, Passion and Palm killed and ate one of their uh, colleagues, one, one of the, their, uh, a, a female that uh, they were in the same community with. They killed and ate their baby, and she still doesn't understand why. Mm. Um, there are uh, primates that are less despotic. And again, I'll refer to Sarah Blaffer Hurdy, um, who's done a lot of research on this. And um, she uh, mentions the golden lion tamarins, which is uh, a new world monkey living in the South American rainforest, high up 
in the trees and they're little guys. They're just, they're about as big as squirrels, but they have an instinctual urge to feed other young golden lion tamarins in the same community. So for example, the men, it doesn't matter if they're male or female. Um, it doesn't matter if it is their uh, offspring or someone else. They just have this reflexive action to feed youngsters. Whatever food they have, they will share it. And the difference is between them and humans is what they're doing is entirely instinctual. It is a reflexive movement and the the species has evolved um, mostly the reason that they figured out is that the mothers have a tendency to be very irresponsible and they'll just take off one day leave the kids and join another group um, and the rest of the community will take care of them so the way the species evolved is it in it that it evolved a, a mechanism by which even if the mother wasn't around there's this reflexive action in all the other adults to just feed children anyway. And the golden lion tamarins are doing great um, as a result. Um, but I think the thing to stress about this is that it's an instinct. Um, a great deal of attention lately has been placed on human fathers. And here's the thing about human fathers is they may be fantastic providers. They may be absolutely wholly and completely devoted to uh, providing the best care that they possibly can to their children. And there's other fathers that uh, as soon as they conceive are off to the next adventure and you'll <laughs> never see them again. And human fathers come in both varieties and everything in between. Now, this has caused a great deal of discussion. Why did we evolve that way to be so flexible? And I think when what it comes down to, the reason is, is that, uh, you know, men have to do have to deal with this thing called paternity uncertainty. For most of evolutionary time, we have not had a DNA test where you could see if the kid was really yours. And uh, as a matter of fact, it's probably the case that a lot of men throughout prehistory ended up raising children that weren't really theirs. The <laughs> idea being is that some women uh, would uh, recruit some men for care because they knew that they would be great uh, providers, but they wanted the better genes. They wanted, genetically, they wanted a higher class. And so they might actually mate when they are fertile with uh, a high ranking member of the community who maybe was not interested in providing long term care. Are you accusing of? Are you accusing our prehistorical ancestors of sleeping around a little bit? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, it, and he, here's, it, it's, a, it's a hot button. And let, let's put it this way. It's clearly a hot button um, when we try to discuss these sorts of things. Um, it, it, it brings the temperature a little bit up uh, when we put it in the context of modern conversations. But Here's the thing. I think that in order to untangle what's happening now, here's another reason that you have to understand it from an evolutionary context. Mm. Look, paternity uncertainty is something that the human male has been living with for millions of years, not to mention the rest of the primate order. It is something that uh, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, uh, any organism uh, would have a right to be concerned about. From a, just from an evolutionary perspective, both shame and um, parental uncertainty likely had huge positive impacts in this, the development of the species. So they're, they're quite often, they'd be seen as negative things nowadays. They'd be seen as 
think you know things that you'd speak about in a negative connotation being shamed um obviously not knowing who your dad is they're, they're seen as sort of you know negative experiences but from a socially selective point of view you're saying it maybe had a huge impact in us uh, us coordinating and, and working cohesively well let's let's go back a little bit further because first of all in terms of monogamy in a community where the expectation is is that everybody is going to be monogamous then yes there are very stringent rules about who gets to mate with whom and when uh, with that in mind it's extremely unlikely that monogamy uh, was the operative um, breeding system uh, for, for the past million years. It may have existed, I think it probably did, but it existed among a lot of other possibilities. So before we start uh, discussing exactly what behavior elicited exactly what response from the community, let's start with this. Let's start with the idea is that humans started to have rules mm. about who you could mate with and when, when it was okay and when it wasn't. Sometimes, perhaps, that involved monogamy. But I think probably more often it may have involved polygyny and less often polyandry. Polygyny is when you have one fella and he gets most of the action. He gets most of the uh, uh, mating opportunities from the women in his yeah, community. Right. Why? Because they see him, if, if he's got the most prestige, um, then, then he is the one that uh, they would want to mate with. Now, when you mull this over to yourself, what a, and it, it's actually, it's something I enjoy. I enjoy thinking about this kind of thing. When you mull it over to yourself for a while, you're going to ask yourself, yeah, but you got the one high ranking guy because he's a good hunter and all the women go to him. But what about all the other fellas in the community? Aren't they going to start getting kind of pissed off about this? Yeah. And the answer is yes, they are. And in a community where we are striving for cooperation and the, for people to be generally happy with the way things are going, and that's necessary for the sort of cooperation that we know occurred, well, something had to happen. We had to figure out a way where mating opportunities became more equitable and it became possible for a fellow that did his best and put his best put forward to end up in the next generation, to be successful at procreating, to end up being a father. And again, exactly how that happened and exactly how did we go from being kind of chimpanzee-like to being human-like? That's a really tough one. That's a conjecture. But I think we can start with the idea that we started making rules and people started following them to a greater or lesser extent for a good part of history. And it became very successful uh, for us to do that and then Fast forward a couple million years, we end up where the overarching expectation is monogamy. So, I mean, we um, it's been fascinating already, uh, Kevin, but uh, I am conscious we haven't really touched on prehistory as such. Um, and I was just, I wondered then when you would think that there are examples of shame in the human story are we you, know, you mentioned millions of years ago are we talking homo erectus are uh -huh. we talking uh later than that neanderthal you know what when would you recognize those aspects and 
this is something where a lot of people have been putting a lot of um, ideas out. Um, in archaeology and in anthropology, you hear the word parsimony a lot or parsimonious. And basically what that means is we're never going to know for a fact exactly when this happened and when exactly that happened because there's just not enough evidence. The way it works is that somebody suggests a theory. They try to make it as parsimonious as possible, meaning they don't go too far in their conjectures and they use as much physical evidence as they possibly can to base their theory on. Now, that being said, among the more parsimonious theories are that beginning with Homo erectus, um, their emergence in Africa a couple million years ago, actually it might have been a little longer than that, uh, coincided with changes in the environment when forest and jungle was turning into savanna, flat plains where uh, uh, hunting was possible, where big cats were taking down antelopes, where elephants and zebras and lions and tigers and, and all these were roaming free and eating the vegetation there. And because of the changing environment, it forced one of humans uh, ancestors out of the trees. Now, what did that do? As humans were forced out of the trees because uh, their environment was changing and their way of life was changing, the way that they were get, getting food was changing, they needed to begin cooperating. You see, the trees gave safety, and they still do, to primates. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a tree to protect you from the lions, well, then what is? And the answer is, is that people needed to start cooperating more. They started walking. They started walking upright. Now, one thing that happened when they started walking upright, which was more conducive to their way of life outside of the trees. Well, first of all, they became uh, less adept at climbing trees, but they also, uh, the, the uh, female cervix of necessity became narrower. Now, as the female cervix became narrower because of the configuration of a walking hominin bipedal primate, that means that childbirth became more difficult. Now, you can probably see where I'm going with this. As childbirth became more difficult and people needed more cooperation and their way of life was changing because of the way that they were uh, hunting food and getting food regularly, um, they also needed to figure out what are we going to do about human child care. We're the only animal, along with uh, cooperation being needed to feed human infants, we're the only animal where assisted childbirth is, is customary. Most human births are uh, assisted. And um, there are specialists um, who believe that the need for assisted childbirth in humans is at least a million years old. We have been helping each other with childbirth for that long. Now, it is my belief that that's when it started that when humans started to become emotionally modern was at the point in time where in order to survive required a greater amount of uh, concern for the needs of expectant mothers and uh, neonatal situations of, expect of expectant mothers, um, as well as their ongoing needs after that. 
And if you think about what would be required of a community and how those needs would be met, I think that that entails uh, an emotional environment that would have to include shame and pride, like we have been talking about. And uh, that would uh, elicit uh, enough childcare uh, so that early human babies could uh, emerge successfully from their mother's womb um, in extremely difficult circumstances, but in addition, continued to be cared for. Um, the Savannah hypothesis is one hypothesis among many. It is parsimonious in the sense that we do have archeological evidence that there, there seems to be this accretion um, of, of human characteristics, our feet, our stomachs, the way we walk, female cervix uh, was configured and uh, from bones that we can look at at that time. They all point to the idea that we became more social. And yes, two million years ago is a rough estimate of that time, but it's very hard to pin down to a, a particular point in time when exactly we became cooperative and when that exactly involved particular emotions as we understand them now. But wouldn't, I mean, I guess that it would make sense in a way because it ties in with other sort of cognitive firsts that Homo erectus probably presented. So my understanding would be Homo erectus was obviously the first hominin to leave or first early human to leave Africa and also the first one to sort of use rudimentary or um, second stage stone tools where they'd kind of broken something to create it to be a tool. So that it feels mm -hmm. like those kind of cognitive leaps, those kind of creative sparks would tie in with the same more social um, group cohesion development. Here's the thing, when you read more and more about this, um, if, uh, if you, try to focus on one particular um, proto-human, such as Homo erectus, um, that it all started with them. There is always some competing theory. Yes, yes, there was Homo erectus, but you know, there was Heidelbergensis and they were doing this and, and yes, yes, there was this, this, this other uh, hominin that, that was uh, near that time and um, the problem is, is that you can never nail it down mm. with certainty. And what I have found in terms of uh, trying to narrate this story about shame is to be specific when it's possible to be specific, but also to round the edges when you can't. So, for example, if I were to say something like, yup, yup, it was Homo erectus, it all started with Homo erectus that started the shaming, that would get knocked down in, by other cultural anthropologists in seconds. They'd make quick work of me. And rightfully so, because that they would just point out too many other possibilities when these things could have plausibly started. For example, there are many people who say that emotional modernity happened much, much later. It didn't really happen until maybe 50,000 years ago when we start having hard evidence of, uh, for instance, art. And uh, that there are stone figurines of uh, women that, that we believe represented goddesses and the Chauvet cave paintings in France. And those both, uh, those both date back about 35,000 years. And if you are to make the argument that emotional modernity began at the same time as our ability for symbolic thinking, which would have included art, well, then you are in a position to say that all of these things, uh, it, 
shame and shaming as we know them today in modern life are, are actually really quite recent, not more than 50 or 75 years ago. So that's where we are. We're in a place where we can say, well, it could have been 4 million years ago and it could have been 50,000 years ago. I don't know. And the, the way I'm trying to structure my own narrative around this is to, uh, well, is, is to make all possibilities uh, feasible. But uh, I, I would like whoever is interested in the subject uh, to know that the most important part of uh, this discussion is that um, modern emotions did evolve exactly when we don't know and that it is very likely that it did involve the complex social goals that i'm interested in like hunting and cooking and child care hmm. fascinating stuff i could speak to you for hours but i want to try and keep the, the recordings to about an hour each time would you be happy to come back on at some point and talk to me a bit more in the future i sure would have we already gone for an hour yeah, I think so. Pretty much. Uh, yeah. Boy, I've got a big mouth. No, that's yes, it's I'm, brilliant. Okay. I'm more than happy to come back. Fantastic. Okay. Well, in the meantime, if any of you guys that are listening have got questions for Trevor, if he comes back on, or any other guests that you'd like me to try and uh, speak to, or are uh, any potential guests that would like to speak to me, uh, the email address is bunchofapes at gmail.com. Um, Yes, yeah, so a fascinating conversation there with Trevor. Uh, really glad that you came on. Thank you so much, Trevor, and hope to see you on here again soon. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'm delighted. Thank you for having me.